we are actually going to be doing uh building some batteries this weekend so <laughs> the thing that i wanted to share with everyone also is that so as we're ge gearing up and saying hey we need to build these batteries for the community out here who does a, what's called a pop-up village so they have like community resources once a month that they give back to the community where they have um uh, dental care, prenatal care, postnatal care, postpartum care, like all these wonderful things for um, the community and really geared toward moms and children of the community, which is really nice. But they have this outdoor event where they shut down a block every month and they have a DJ, they have medical resources that come in. We've been using uh, the battery, the batteries in their spare time or when they're not being used for or emergencies to help power this event to get them off of generators and so forth we're at the point now where we're going to build batteries for them so we don't have to transport them there we've been doing it for maybe two months we're going to do a battery build just to educate the community on how to how to build their own backup batteries and also those batteries will be housed and stay with this particular community when we're done in preparation for that i'll just share with everyone kind of our thought process and what, what we're going through here. My first step is Craigslist. Hop on Craigslist and then I type in whatever type of batteries I'm going to use. Let's say we're using lithium batteries. I type in lithium batteries and it's going to pull up a search for all the lithium batteries in my area that are for sale. Some of them are new, some of them are used. I did this couple of days ago and I think what I came up with was there is not too close to us but not too far away it's about an hour away south there's a city called Gilroy in Gilroy they have I think we discussed this before so just by chance they have if anyone's ever been like to the ER or to the hospital the nurses have this cart and the doctors do too they have a cart that has a monitor on it and they have a, a laptop docking station where they can dock their laptop and they unplug it from one room and then they go to the next room, they plug it back in and type some stuff. And sometimes they have like little printers attached and so forth to, to take people's vitals and so forth. Those carts have, have lithium ion batteries on them. They're 12 volt, 50 amp hour batteries, which are really nice. They go, when they switch those out, they go based off of the time frame that they've been in service. They don't go by like the capacity of the battery or how many cycles the battery has. It's let's say every year we're required to swap this out. Uh, for instance, every year they're going to swap those out and put new ones in there. So that battery may be at 10% of its life cycle. It may be at 20% of its life cycle. But if we look at the application where they're going to plug that in one room, roll to another room, plug it into the other room, the amount of time that that actual battery is being used is very low. So it has a, when you get them used, they still have a very high life expectancy. So those are like very premier batteries to try to snag. So the ones here, they're in Gilroy. Um, they're asking $150 for the entire unit, the rolling cart and everything. So we don't need the cart, of course, we're just looking for the actual batteries but $150 for a 12 volt, 50 amp hour battery that's lithium is a great, great deal. Buying them new, we'd probably be spending about twice that amount. And then if we got a hundred amp hour battery, sometimes they're like three, maybe $400. So to be able to get a 50 amp hour battery, which we could just take two of those and tie them together. And that would give us a 12 volt, a hundred amp hour battery which is exactly what we're looking for, for this particular project. So that's the first thing that we look for is the, the largest component or the most, usually the most expensive component. The next thing that we're going to look for is going to be a way to charge it. So we're going to get a, a charge controller. Yep. So we want to be able to control the charge to that battery. So that's called a charger. And sometimes it's called a charge controller. So that just says, I have voltage coming in that needs to be controlled and delivered to my battery at 12 volts. And there's a little piece of equipment that does that. So we'll be looking for a charge controller next. Next component, the inverter. 
So what the inverter is going to do is allow us to take that stored energy that's inside of the battery and to use that. We're going to take that 12 volts, 100 amp hours, and be able to convert it to a DC, be able to convert it to AC power. So we can plug in alternating current appliances, which it's about 50-50 in a household, what's alternating current, what's direct current. A lot of the things that we think are alternating current are actually direct current, such as a laptop. A lot of people are like, I plug that into the wall. This is alternating current. Your laptop has a battery, a rechargeable battery in there, which means it's actually direct current. And the way that our relation is with energy and the way that the energy system works here, we waste a lot of energy. So we take alternating current and we convert that to direct current to power our, our laptop. So we're using 20% more power than we would use if it was just direct current to direct current. And that 20% gets wasted in converting it from AC to DC. So just something to keep in mind, if you guys have a DC component, try to charge it with DC. If you convert it, and sometimes you have systems like solar, you take it from DC and you may convert it to AC right away, or you may convert it to DC sorry, DC to like a battery storage and then AC to discharge. Every time you do a conversion, you're, you're wasting about 20% just as a general frame of reference. But we want to get our inverter. We talked about before about how to size the inverter. So I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. So the type of inverter or the size of the inverter, it's going to be rated at a certain wattage. So you'll have a thousand watt inverter, you might have a 2000 watt inverter, you might have a 3000 watt inverter, and you're trying to figure out like, hey, which one do I need? We talked about looking at your appliances and the things that you're using and how to look at those and add them up to see how much, what, what your wattage is gonna be, that's gonna be your demand. This is how much I need. So that will size your inverter. So if I look at my house and I'm like, I have lights that I want to power and I have 10 lights and all the 10 lights are three watts each because they're LED lights. So I'm going to need 30 watts for lighting. Um, and then I look and I say, I have a refrigerator. My refrigerator takes 1500 watts. So I'm going to need, you know, what was our first number? 30 plus 1500. So uh, 1,530. And then on top of that, I'm going to need CPAP machine. My CPAP machine is 120 watts. So you're going to basically do a sizing when you size all those things and you're going to have a, a wattage that you come out with. And I'm giving you guys the skinny because the video will probably go into more detail about that. So you'll have your wattage and you'll say, great, I need uh, uh, 1,900 watts. And you'll look and you'll say, oh, look, there's an inverter here. It's a 2,500 watt inverter or it's a 2,000 watt inverter that will handle my demand. So I think I'm going to go ahead and, and get that one. So that inverter will take care of your energy demand based off of what you calculate your energy demand to be. Um, that's a very important step. Um, when you do off-grid solar sizing, it's like one of the major steps that they do to size your inverter based off of, they usually just use your PG&E bill for that because your PG&E bill has what your monthly consumption is and people's behavior doesn't change. It's going to be based off of whatever pg e has on record that they give you for your bill that you're paying for. It'll say, this is your consumption, and you'll look at that, and you'll go, I don't consume that much. I'll change. And they'll say, no, we need to sell you this really expensive inverter because this is your consumption, and it's, it's not going to change. Trust them, it's not going to change. So go ahead and get the inverter that's the right size. That way, when you use it, one, you don't pop the fuse, and two, it's going to actually supply the amount of power that you need. So we're just going to get, for our system here, since it's just going to be an off-grid system, it's powering, one of them is going to power like a DJ that's going to be there. We have another one that powers a school bus that's there. It powers the lighting on the school bus. It powers all the laptops that are plugged in on the school bus, all the monitors that are plugged in on the school bus. And then there's another one that does a second stage at the same venue where there's a presentation stage where people do demonstrations for uh, eating healthy. So there's like a health food demonstration. They go over or approach your pantry, how to look at your pantry, how to look at the foods in your pantry. And then it also goes over 
of the health benefits for the individual and also goes over how to prepare things. So there's a lot of new vegetables or new foods that are introduced to people's vocabularies, which is one thing to introduce people to new food. It's another thing to share with them how to prepare the food and how to actually utilize that similar to the work that we're doing here. We're just doing a thousand watt inverters. We might have one that's a 2000 watt, but it'd be a thousand watt inverter for the systems is what we're looking for. So same idea. We go into Craigslist, we type in inverter, someone's selling an inverter somewhere. So once someone wants to get rid of one, we need one and we'll buy that secondhand. There's also other websites that people can get stuff and shop for stuff. It's not only Craigslist, but Craigslist is a communal site, which is easy, a nice communal site. I think there's other community ones, but I'm not too hip on them. There might be other ones in your area. Thank you, Tom. Free cycle. There's a neighborhood one. I forget what the neighborhood one is. I'm trying to stay away from the eBay and trying to stay away from like the Amazon. Just because at the end of the day, the footprint of getting that material to you is, is really amazing. So yeah, an inverter. And then what's our next component? Solar. Somebody put solar in the thing, wires, cables. I'll go over wire cables probably at the end. So let's say solar. So I'm going to take solar as a way to charge. So we need a, a source to charge that battery. So we have a battery. We have an inverter. Inverter is going to be out. That's energy leaving the system goes through the inverter. Energy coming into the system goes through the charge converter. Energy that stays in the system is the battery. Now we're talking about where the energy comes from. So that energy source coming into the system can be solar, or it can also be like AC voltage. You can plug it into the wall and charge it up. And your charge controller needs to be, it's going to be based off of if it's coming from solar, a DC source, or if it's coming from alternating current source, such as plugging it into the wall. So that will tell you what type of charge controller you're going to get. There's some that do both. So you can get a one that takes solar input and one that also takes AC input. That's going to be a solar panel in essence is going to get plugged into your charge converter. So when the sun's out, the solar rays hit the solar panel, it takes that energy and it transfers it into the wires. Those wires are now hooked up to your charge controller, which cleans up the energy. It makes it so when it comes through there, it's it can be delivered at 12 volts and your battery doesn't get a shock. It's not necessarily dipping your toe in the water, but acclimating your temperature before you hop in the water. So there's no shock to the system. The battery charges up. After the battery charges up, now you need to use that that energy, which we're talking about shock, we should probably go into the inverter. I'm going to back up one step and go back to the inverter. There's two types of inverters that you'll see that are very common. One is called a pure sine wave, pure sine inverter. And the other one is called a modified inverter. The skinny of that is try to get the pure sine. It's closer. It's a lot closer to what you plug into normally inside of your house. So if you're using it to operate anything with a motor or anything that has a constant demand, the pure sign will be able to provide that constant demand regulated. So you're going to get a, a, a constant frequency with the pure sign versus a modified sign. You won't get that. It's uh, abbreviated. If you're using like a power drill or something like that, you may need to plug in there or again, anything with the motor. It's going to change the way that the, the motor responds to that. So just look for a, a pure sine wave inverter. If you guys are looking for inverters, just to make it extremely easy, that's going to do what you guys needed to do. It's more compatible with uh, more things as well. So back to the charge controller, there's a, a lot of information online about how to wire things in parallel or. So as far as wiring, you guys can just Google it. It's going to be there. There's just ultimately there's two ways to daisy chain batteries together. 
So you can wire, if you have a 12 volt, I think I said earlier that they, these people are selling 12 volt, 50 amp hour batteries. At the end of the day, we want to have 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries, which means we need to buy two batteries. Depending on how we wire those, we can either have um, 24 volts at 50 amp hours, which we don't want, or we can have uh, 12 volts at 100 amp hours. So that's a very easy Google, so I'm not going to go into details about that. It's how you hook up your positive and negative terminals. So don't get too caught up on that. <laughs> um, just uh, Just Google it. And if I told you, you wouldn't remember. I'm going to go to my battery for my battery i'm going to go to my inverter for my inverter i'm going to go to whatever i'm going to plug into to my inverter the power it's going to get into wiring but i think eugene's going to tell me i'm missing something what's up eugene <laughs> i was going to ask you about wiring <laughs> okay <laughs> thank what, you very much what size of wiring okay so wiring um when we get into wiring sizes I'm going to try to make this as easy as possible for everyone. So we talked before about how to get the wattage um, in our calculations. So you're going to do the same thing to get the amperage for your application. So when we did the math for everything, when we went over batteries, we went over how to get the wattage, and we also went over how to get the amperage. Once you figure out what your amperage is, you're going to size your wires based off of your amperage. If I'm using 20 amps, I do my calculations and I'm like, oh, it's 20 amps or 18 amps or whatever it's going to be. I'm going to say that's going to be 12 gauge wiring. If I say, oh, it's 15 amps, I'm going to say, okay, that's 14 gauge wiring. If I go, oh, it's 50 amps, I'm going to say 50 amps is eight gauge wiring and all the wiring is going to be for what are called short runs. So runs that are under 50 feet in length. And when you get over 50 feet, then that's when the, it changes, but you guys are going to Google. And this is a, another very easy thing to Google. You're going to Google whatever your amperage is. Let's say it's 20 amps. You're going to say 20 amps wire size and Google is going to have a form that comes up. That's an electrical form, very easy to read. If I could share a screen, I would with you guys, but it's just going to be a form that's going to pop up and it's just going to say, if you're, if it's 20 amps, you need 12 gauge uh, cable. If it's 50 amps, you need eight gauge cable or six gauge. It'll give you like two different types, but that's how you're going to determine what your wire size is going to be. That wire size is going to be consistent throughout your system. The main place you have to concentrate on that is going to be from your input. So if I have, let's say, 10 solar panels that are all tied together and those 10 solar panels are putting out 50 amps, then I'm going to gauge that wire between my solar panels and my charge controller to be appropriate. From my charge controller to my batteries to be the same and from my batteries to my inverter to be the same. Where to get wiring from? Again, Craigslist is always a good place. Sometimes people use old extension cords. If you have an extension cord that doesn't work anymore and you know the wire gauge size of the extension cord, that's a, another option there. Anyone have any other options for how to go about getting wire? Those are the two that come to mind that are pretty straightforward. Wouldn't you just go to like an appliance place because they throw a lot of stuff out and I would just like glean from them and then for your thrift stores because they get a lot of stuff that they throw out and I would just like, go there and pick that up and then strip it because then you have the wires. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very, very good one. Uh, uh, last time I went to Goodwill, actually, they had um, dr a dryer wire there, which is six gauge dryer wire. They're selling it for $1.50 or uh, whatever it was, six feet of it which is dirt cheap. And that one, one length of wire depends on how large your setup is. A large horizontal space it takes can probably do the entire thing for your entire, your entire setup. Theater shops, events, production shops might have them. Thank you. And there's also a tool to determine wire gauges for a couple of dollars at the hardware store. 
Yes. So they, they have WireGate sizing tools. So if you have, let's say, an old extension cord and you're like, I don't know how large this is, and you can take this tool, if it fits through the hole, it, whichever one it fits to the most snug would be that wire gauge. So yes, there's also a calculator online that let's say you have them and it's too small. They'll tell you how many like 12 gauges you need to twist together to get something larger. But again, wire is one of, one of the components that's probably going to be the least expensive component that you purchase. And one other place that I would recommend is like the high schools because you have all the like electric and science and all that. And they throw away so much stuff because they don't use it. And those that would be probably what you'd find in those like electrical classes and things. They don't save everything. They throw a lot of stuff away because that, that's how I've been able to get like parts to the computers that I sometimes put together from the schools. Nice. Thank you for that. And Meredith uh, mentioned that uh, extension cords have rat poison mixed into the, the, the jackets surrounding the wires to keep creatures from chomping on the wires. So just a heads up there. There's other um, options here for getting wire. One of the major ways to get a lot of these also is if you know anyone who works at Home Depot and you have the Home Depot hookup, they okay. throw away like all of this stuff they throw away. So there'll be stuff that's like an inverter that's the package is open it goes into trash there's a, a pack of electrical wire that has a hole in it or is damaged in some way it goes into trash there's a giant dumpster that sits behind home depot which is a gold mine but they don't let people into that you just have to make sure you find a, a good contact at the store so you make baked goods good place to spend your baked goods places like big box stores here we have menards but probably Lowe's does it too. If they have odd sizes, odd lengths of wire that was cut to sell to a customer, maybe six feet left over, they'll sell that at a cheaper price by the foot. Thank you. You might be like, where are we going to get solar panels? But my, literally in my personal experience, but, and yours would be different, but just the power of people and talking about like finding hookups and things. In my area, I, I put out a flyer we're looking for to start this battery collective in this group. And somebody came out and just said that they worked at Tesla and that they just had a whole bunch of dummy test solar panels that they were just going to throw away. So similar thing. We got a hundred, we just had to show up with a big box truck. And we got a hundred solar panels for free used one time. So there's opportunities out there. Again, talk, just talking to people can sometimes create opportunities to resources that you would never even have known existed. It makes sense that like Home Depot also has similar things going on with wood and other accessories. So thank you for that. Speaking of solar panels, yeah, same thing. Craigslist and then I like Kansas's way, just networking to try to figure it out. So there was something about how many solar panels, I think, to charge up the batteries. So if we had a 12 volt battery and let's say it's a thousand watt battery is what we have and we were trying to figure out how many solar panels do we need to charge that which is a common question it's an interesting question too but it depends on a few things so the first variable is the size of your solar panel how many watts is your solar panel putting out so let's say your solar panel is putting out 200 watts so some people are under the impression that, okay, 200 watts my solar panel is putting out, I have a thousand watt battery I need to charge, that means I need five solar panels, right? So if you guys remember before when we talked about watts and we talked about the measurement of the watts, we were saying that this is what's called watt hours. I would get five solar panels if I wanted to have that battery charged in one hour. Five solar panels will get me a thousand watts in one hour. If I were like in a rush, I need to charge this battery up in one hour. If I'm not in a rush, I can take that one solar panel, that 200 watt solar panel, and it will charge up that 1000 watt battery. It's just going to take five times the amount of time. So it would take five hours for one panel to do it. Five panels would take one hour to do, if that makes sense. And that's minus the 20% that we talked about already about how you lose 
the conversion, the wires take a little bit. So it's not an exact number. It's a ballpark number, just so everyone understands that. I'm saying that to say some people get caught up going, I need to get five panels. You don't need to get this, whatever you, if you have one panel, great, start with one panel. When you get a second panel, you can add that second panel to the system. It's going to charge it possibly twice as fast. But when you're getting solar panels, the other thing people get caught up on is, especially if they're getting them aftermarket or just grabbing what they can get, they'll get caught up on, oh, I have one solar panel that's 200 watts. I have another solar panel that's 400 watts. I can't use those together. So you can use them together. It's just going to have, you're going to be losing wattage, basically. It's going to go to whatever the default, to whatever the lowest uh, wattage of the system is. So you can tie them together to both DC. They're both putting out the same thing. It's just going to have the lower wattage. So you'll be wasting that. In a situation where that we're talking about 200 and 400 watts, it wouldn't make sense. You would just hook up the 400 watt one because you're actually losing 200 watts. So you just would not use the 200 watt versus hooking them both up. But I'm just trying to make sure everyone understands the premise of it so they can take that premise and then expand on it offline and hopefully somebody's taking some notes somewhere. I think it's a good call out just talking about really quickly the function, the hundred percent functioning versus like degree of the, the panels. Uh, people do rotate them out, even though they're still working, they're just not working at a hundred percent efficiency mm -hmm. they used to. So that's a good call out. You, that's another thing to consider. You may have to have more panels, but if you need them in a crisis, right? You're getting energy. That's energy that's being produced. I have a question. Um, so I have eight solar panels that were left over from a job and my son just brought them home. And I was like, what am I going to do with this? And he's like, just keep them. We might need them. And I'm like, all right. So I put them away and heck, I don't know how to read them. Do they have something written on the outside of them that will like allow me to be able to to find what kind of panel it is. Are there different types of panels that can be used? And is there any kind of dangerous thing? Because I've never really touched a solar panel before and it's sitting there and I'm, don't touch it because I don't know what it does. <laughs> and if I'm able to do something with it, because if, if I can make a grid for the community, that's like a source of energy. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I'll drop in chat. I just YouTube like how to read a solar panel, but yes, every solar panel usually comes with the sticker. Sometimes they, you may not see one. Sometimes it may be faded. It may be gone. It may be somebody may have removed it or scratched it off, but usually it's on the back of the panel and it will have the things that you're looking for. It has the voltage, the output voltage of it. It has the output current of it, the amperage. It has the the basic solar panel. So you'll have a 400 watt solar panel. It'll say 400 watts, and then you'll read the back sticker, and it tells you the amperage that it's pushing that out at. It'll show you the the wattage, the actual wattage. It'll show you the voltage that it's going to generate. The things that you're concerned about. The main things you're concerned about is is basically the wattage and the voltage that it's going to push it out at. There's a 12 volt solar panels which uh, is nice because you can hook that directly up to a battery. They say to put a charge controller in there because you want, again, 12 consistent volts. So you can, but you don't have to if you're in a pinch. You may get a, something like 23 volt or 24 volt solar panel. You can have a 48 volt solar panel. You can have a 60 volt solar panels. Those are the things that you're looking for on the back. Those those you're going to, again, put through your charge controller. Your charge controller is going to be based off of your solar panels, what's coming in and what's going out. So charge controllers will say that they can convert, let's say, 48 volts to 12 volts, and it'll have 12 volts coming out. Some of them are selectable, so they'll have a little pin that you can say, I want 12 volts going out, or I want 24 volts going out, or I want 48 volts going out. But right now we're just talking about 12. So you just turn that to 12 and you'll have 12 volts coming in, 12 volts going out, or whatever voltage is coming in and you'll have 12 volts going out. So you may have a 24 volt panel that's hooked up and you'll have a 12 volt panel out. But I dropped it in link and it'll tell you, it should give you to tell you the breakdown. Are all the panels that you're talking about the same exact panels or are they like Mod Podge? 
they're the same. They're like about, I would say eight of them all together. But the more I'm involved with this whole project, I start thinking, heck, I can just make a, a grid and then other people can use it in our community. And there might be other people that are doing, have the same thing because any kind of project, you get people that leave stuff all the time at the sites. And some people are conscious of what they're disposing. Other people just put it away in the garage and figure like one day I might have to replace one. So here's the extra panel or whatever. But if people were aware of what they actually had, they would be able to glean and create energy within their homes so they could like have a backup in case something does happen. They're probably like 400 watt panels. And if you have eight of those, that's 3,200 watts, which is the, the normal consumption for a four, sorry, a three family home. Three kilowatts is right around what a three to four family home uses a day. So you could take that and hook it up to an in solar panels, hook them up to an inverter, plug those into your wall, plug the inverter like literally into one of your sockets in your wall. And basically your some meters turn backwards, some meters don't, some they just stop turning. But basically you're paying for your you're taking care of your own power supply. It's like a solar system that's sort of the same thing, but yeah, it does that definitely. It's yeah. so bizarre, but that technology is available. But like, if I wouldn't have learned about this program, there wouldn't have been, been a real reason for me to even delve into trying to understand this because it's cool and it's really uh, regenerative in the sense that like you you didn't realize you had all this resource in within your hands and reach. And I'm not the only one. So that's, it excites me because I think, wow, if I can get more people that come out and say, we have that, or we're wondering what that is, or how do we explore that? And so I just really want to thank you because even just these conversations, it's good for, for provocative thinking in community, just to say, Hey, what do we have? What is our power analysis within our own community and the scape of who we're connected to? I think and that's actually a great closeout, I think, honestly. Thank you, Martha, for that. I will hand it over to Tom. I know you had something you wanted to address before. Yeah. As you mentioned, we're getting really close to the end. We just have one more session. And so I mentioned earlier about the kind of homework between sessions, uh, between this one and the next one. And so the next thing that we'll be working on over the course of this week is to create outlines for your launch plans. So I've created a template. It's just five questions to be able to fill out. You should be able to make a copy of this and put your city, region, whatever your scope is, which is one of the questions down below. And so you can just title it as such, and then we'll be going over them in the next session. Uh, so any other questions that come up, are there any other barriers to launch, what have you, we'll, we'll be discussing on that. Cool. Thank you, Tom. And thank yeah. you, everyone. I Thank you for continuing to be engaging with just like and thinking about it, talking with your community. The possibilities are really endless when you start talking and figuring out what your community could possibly be and how you want to collectively resolve decisions. So it's very exciting to hear all of your questions and um, everyone engaging with their communities. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Peace out, everyone. All right. We'll see you next time, everyone. One more class, one more session, one more gathering. <laughs> Peace. Peace, everyone.